yeah. of uh, 20 years or 50 to 20 years as good the air, as the Air Force is today. Is that, is that, is that a good marketing for your office? Right. Um, my specialty in life, I came to work for the Air Force in the early 80s. I did design cockpits because I was I had a commercial class license for rating. I've been in the uh, Air Force for, at that point, about seven years as a reservist, flying on 123s, 130s. 141. So I knew what went on the back end of the aircraft, and lo and behold, they made me design cockpits. I got out of that, went into propulsion. <clears throat> I got to work on scramjet testing. It was kind of fun. I got to work on, um, at about the same time I did that, I started my own rocket engine company back in the, uh, in the 80s. And a friend of mine who uh, studied this at, 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 at business school said that every company that started rockets from the early 80s, so by the late 80s, early 90s, all of them died, 100% of them. None of them survived through the valley of death, which caught up the next group suddenly was able to make because they had a lot more money. Big difference. Um, I came to work with my current job about 15 years ago. I did, I did high-speed fuels for rockets, engines, for scramjets, ramjets, uh, turbines that go real fast, all those sort of things. That's the sort of stuff I, I get to do at work. And hopefully in about 18 months, I'll retire. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk to you about amateur and liquid activities and orbital initiatives. Um, I'm going to. I actually took Friday off, Friday afternoon, because I just felt like crap. I think you can tell my voice isn't that good. I'm going to call up a storm, so if I call for a sneeze or something like that, just, just ignore me. I asked my wife to come. I thought there'd be a lot of nice people here. She just didn't want to want to come. But I, I should, I should. I told her on this. I should build you guys. I had to take her out to dinner tonight to get out back because <laughs> I was going to come here and talk. So that's the way she looks at it. Literally. So I'm going to talk. Here's my obligatory outline. I'm going to talk about the liquid amateurs that are in the, are in the country, the um, orbital aspirations of some of those folks. And I'll tell you what are the problems are of orbital aspirations if you have any. Uh, talk about my group, the Midwest Propulsion Group. And then I'm going to show you. We did a static test for it about nine years ago. We first uh, was getting this stuff going, and we had a failure. And the, the, what I'm going to brief to you is the failure of uh, the investigation of the failure. Um, <clears throat> first, there are numerous liquid rocket amateur groups in the country. The first one I'd like to talk about is the oldest, the Reaction Research Society. They are, I envy those guys. You know, you go anywhere west of Missouri, any of these big open spaces, right? You can stop, fly a rocket, fire your test in, and nobody's, there's nobody to see. You got to go to the Mojave Desert, you know, in California. Those guys fly and fire big things, I mean massive things. Uh, RRS was first founded, I think, in 48 um, by some people who are, California is a rocket state. LA is a rocket city. Ohio, Dayton, Ohio is an airplane city. I've been in this round here for 30 years working. This is not a rocket city, I guarantee it. Friends of Amateur Rocketry, <coughs> as all organizations grow and change, there are individuals in it that sometimes have friction. And after a few drinks over with a few guys, basically they, they broke up because two groups didn't like each other. So the, if you go on, um, uh, look for the Mojave Desert where the Friends of Amateur Rocketry place is, you'll see this huge facility and right beside it, 30 yards down, is the RRS facility in the middle of the desert. That's, they just built two separate facilities. Uh, San Diego State University, uh, they have, they uh, got some money from NASA and somebody else. They built a 3D printed engine. They literally are probably the first college students to do it, although not the first people to build 3D print engines. They static fired it at the uh, FAR site. They were trying to fly it at the last year at the um, Intercollegiate Rocket Engineering Competition, which I was a judge at. I was their judge because I was about the only guy there who had liquids experience. And they didn't fire for a lot of reasons. They just weren't ready. They, <clears throat> they had some issues with loads, road problems. <coughs> Boston University has an interesting nitrous oxide um, alcohol uh, engine and some vehicles they've flown. Uh, Copenhagen is a more Anybody ever heard of Copenhagen? I'm just, these guys, this crowd's got to have heard of Copenhagen. So okay, these, those guys are impressive. They're flying a man vehicle. I looked to be able to build a man vehicle years ago, but it was just a lot of money that I didn't have. Um, they use the LOX alcohol. They have lots of volunteers. These are professional engineers doing it, and they're, they've, raised, they've raised lots of money. The um, Cal State University of Long Beach and Garvey spacecraft. Uh, many times these universities will have somebody like I was with UD. Steve Garvey is with Cal State Long Beach. Um, the guys at UC San Diego have uh, Steve Harrington um, from Flowmetrics. So all these universities usually have somebody who's who's working with them very closely. 
uh, Magar, the, the Cal State Long Beach has built a, um, they built an aerospike engine system, which is very impressive. They actually flew. Now, in this group, I can tell you, num numerous groups are building L and M's and bigger solids than that. People row their own, spend a few thousand bucks, buy a big engine and fly it. That's kind of fun. I, I told, uh, since I'm the judge, I thought I'd put a, a, um, a thing. If you want to go see some interesting rocketry, it's all uh, high power stuff. Uh, it'll be in Utah in June. I go online and look up the Intercollegiate Rocket Engineering Competition 2016. It's very interesting. Of course, it's very hot in the middle of Utah desert in June. It's going to be 100 degrees there. So, but there were, I think, there's something like 60, 60 schools were represented from like eight countries. One kid came from Egypt. He, the, he, he was getting on the aircraft, and they, you know, they have to inspect it. They wouldn't let him bring his nose comb or any of his electronics. I forgot. He got here with the minimal stuff. He ended up building a rocket there. The kids all contributed to help him fly, and he, he, he flew. So um, I, he, got, he got an award for being the guy that you know, did the most with the littlest. Uh, so I'd recommend it. You, and there's lots of uh, YouTube videos of, of these guys flying. Issues with raw li liquids, I thought I'd, I'd give you this since I've been doing this long enough. The first issue is, you know, the classic issue of rocketry, how much money you got. Whatever you got, it'll cost you a lot. It'll, you'll get a small fortune from a big fortune in rocketry. It's pretty complex. You have to do plumbing. <coughs> oh, pardon me. You're loading propellants where solids are much easier. Oxidizers, there's only really two oxidizers, LOX and nitrous oxide. You're sort of stuck one or the other. Uh, for pressurants, uh, they're a little more hydrogen, helium. I've used both. Uh, many things are similar to solids. If uh, triple E guys would know, or you guys would find big stuff, range issues on what I fly, and with a, a big O motor, triple E are almost identical. Um, you need to stack fire engines. Manu the biggest problem you have is manufacturing. You're going to look what you need a machine shop or access to one. I have a, a lathe and I have a grinder. The guy's got a, got a welder in the club. Things like that. You need that stuff to do liquids. And you're doing all that some metal work. A little composite, some wood, mostly metal. Let's talk about some professional or some non-professional guys that spend a lot of money and that they're they're right on the borderline of being professionals. Paul Breed. Um, he built that is the first 3D printed liquid rocket engine, I think, in history. He has that claim to fame. Built at right down here in Cincinnati at um, Morse Technologies before Morse got bought up by uh, GE. And uh, he actually ended up firing that thing. It worked. He makes, for a living, he makes uh, electronic kits and sells them. I guess he does pretty well on that. So all the electronic stuff he goes to. Um, what material is that 3D printed out? I believe it was printed out of a stainless steel. I want to say 316, but don't quote me. It might be three or four. It was a stainless. No, I'm sorry. Why? It's aluminum. It was aluminum. It wasn't stainless. It was aluminum. He looked at stainless. Stainless was a lot more expensive. That was a fifteen thousand dollar engine. So that's, that's a lot of cat. My wife would want me to spend that kind of money. <laughs> what's, what's we can be like that. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I, I asked her to come. She didn't want to. What's uh, Bob of uh, what? Anybody could have guessed pronounce that. What? Well, what's what's what? What's what? What? Bob, I, I had dinner with his, him and his wife in Fort Worth. He's employed at Lockheed Martin, the F thirty five project. Uh, great guy. A beautiful house. I, I hate him because he can test fire in his backyard. <coughs> that is a whole six foot hole he dug in his backyard. Now, this is one of those places outside of Fort Worth, which is, you know, the big mansion place around here where you got a huge house sitting on a tiny plot. In Texas, it's huge houses sitting on five acres. So he goes to the back five acres, which happens to be in the back of his yard, which is the back of everybody else's yard, and digs a hole. And he asks the neighbor, hey, can I shoot? And he said, yeah, go ahead. That's 200 pound thrust lox kerosene, or it's a lox hot call engine. This is no lox kerosene. That's some of the plumbing you have to design. He designed and built that whole thing himself. He's a, he is a master at the craft. You know, there are guys, you, you know the type of guys that rock you up, they just have to have everything perfect. He's, he's that kind of guy. He does a great job doing it. Yes, sir? The Paul Reed engine, how, how big is it? Uh, I want to say it's about 400, 450 pounds of thrust, something in that range. So it, it's about physical that physical. big. Yeah. About the, the exit nozzle, probably about, about that big, maybe a little smaller. I actually got to see that engine once. Here's the other, um, <clears throat> the amateurs to orbit. Um, I called a few friends of mine up and said, hey, have you heard anything about this? And some said yeah, some said no. People are actually doing it, uh, are, are thinking about it. There are some issues, though, if you're going to orbit. The guys, uh, Portland Aerospace, uh, Portland State Aerospace, which are a real big um, high power group in Portland State, um, have talked about it. In fact, I, I was surprised I found articles. He looked it up and said, 
Sci uh, popular Science, 5 August 2015. <coughs> they spoke about they're interested in it. They have a, a, a couple paragraphs about it. And then the, 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 the guy commented that he complained the problems were lawyers and money. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's probably a, a distinct uh, quick way to say it. Sugar Shot to Space. Um, anybody have heard of that? I'm curious. Anybody ever heard of you heard of Sugar Shot? Okay. Uh, those guys actually talked about it while I remember um, uh, I go to the Space Access Society uh, and I was I met Bob, I think his name is Merzak. He's in California, he's a retired school uh, physics teacher. And they, they kicked around the idea, hey, can we could we go to orbit on, on, on sugar? And they sort of played around and said, yeah, you can, but it's a lot of sugar. Sugar is a very brittle propellant. Anybody, have, anybody mix sugar here? I'm curious. Anybody mix sugar? It's, it's easy to do, just get potassium nitrate and sugar and melt sugar and pour potassium nitrate in and stick in a mold. You've got an engine drain. Um, first order estimates, they had them and they were just, the things got to be too big. They were, you know, imagine pouring a sugar grain of like maybe a thousand pounds. That was, that was getting, those grains were huge. They said, nah, we can't do it. So they, they backed out. I'm going to discuss a little bit why. This is the only group I probably have to never discuss what the rocket equation is. I talk to school kids and I can sort of explain what the rocket equation is. There's a bunch of reasons, the challenges, technical challenges, but I have three technical. There's technical, business, and regulatory challenges. Technical challenges are fairly straightforward. Your mass ratio, can you make your vehicle structurally efficient? It's going to be somewhere between a two to a four stage rocket. The guys at Sugar Shop thought they could do it in five stages because it's... It sort of worked out with five stages, but it still had huge first stages to kill them. Um, you got to have available manufacturing technology, either composites or metal. Uh, propulsion, that's the other trick. How, can, how, how much oomph you need? Um, level would be about 100 seconds for sugar, about 350 seconds of uh, specific impulse for a, a reasonably good uh, liquid. That's, that's, that's pushing it. And the other issue is do you make the first stage reusable? A lot of reasons to make the first stage reusable because uh, it saves you a lot of money. You may be able to do it again. The Saturn V, I don't know if you guys knew it, the Saturn V was looked at as being a reusable first stage. They also looked at making steam for the Saturn V, but Von Braun didn't like that. But a reusable first stage would have been an interesting thing because they just fished it out of water and shook it off. The, sa the uh, steam Saturn V first stage would have been made in shipyards because they just filled up with water, turned the water up to a certain level of steam, cut the bottoms out, and took off. It had been, been like twice as big, that's the reason probably they finally killed it. <coughs> the Navy guys have talked about going to the moon from the sea. Imagine doing that, you know, building the ocean. That's the sea launch idea. One of the good things that happens is command, uh, our guidance, command and control uh, systems. Back when, um, you know, the V2 was going on, it was all electromechanical, right? Today, you look at the electronics we put in rockets, they're ridiculous. So electronics we put in something as simple as a... Um, Oh, uh, one of these uh, quadcopters. Those things, the electronics are amazing. The, 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 uh, the accelerometers, the rate gyros are very good. Now, there, there's some issues about you know, how reliable they are and could they take me and shoot the hell out of it if you have a rocket engine, things like that. That's where they can't just throw them in. But there, I bet if you actually play with it, you probably can pull something that works. Uh, telemetry is available to very, very, you can probably get telemetry of them for thousands of bucks, fairly inexpensive. Uh, a bunch of analysis, I have six, a trajectory analysis. You could have something like also structural analysis. Anybody here use SOLIDWORKS? Curious. Uh, SOLIDWORKS is a CAD program, and we, we, have, we had a real good version. And in a week, I taught a high school student to make brackets. And he, I had to test them out for stress. It was amazing. And, and he made, like in two weeks, we were making these brackets he had designed for us. A kid who was like a 10th grader. New manufacturing software gives you tremendous power. When I came to work in the Air Force in 82, you'd walk into a, like Boeing or McDonnell Douglas into a big, huge, looks like a basket or well, probably the size of a football field, full of drawing boards, right? How many of you guys saw that? You ever seen that stuff? The drawing board, and these drawing boards like six foot, and these, these technicians were artists. God, they were great. That's just sort of, I feel sad that we, we, we left that. But, you know, we had to go. So the analysis we can do today is so much more f effective and so much more cheaper than we could then. Control integration is also an easy thing to do today. You can, you can put, put it on MATLAB. Guys who do it professionally do it on MATLAB. I mean, get me, I mean, you can get MATLAB as a student for like 100 bucks. You can buy it now. If you guys want to buy MATLAB, 145 bucks. You can buy the aerospace package for 45 bucks. Because they're, they're giving it away now. I don't know.
they, they realized so many people pirated. All, all the guys that worked at MATLAB told them that they all got their first MATLAB program by pirating it. They said, wow. And these were the guys that worked for them. So they thought, well, let's, let's sort of make, make do something. So software is, is great now. The most expensive part of your rocket will be the flight termination system. I work with a group out in California. They, they're flying small rockets. And they said their flight termination system was $50,000. And all it did was transmit a signal to send a signal to turn the ball battles off. Reason, anybody want to guess why it's so expensive? The vehicle, or that, that thing has to be certified. It has to be stamped, blessed by a certified agent who says, yes, this thing will work when it's supposed to work. That's why, and that's what the range control officer wants. When he presses that button and says stop, it's going to stop. Because their, their interest is in third party liability. Uh, ground support for a launch vehicle, you have facilities. It's, I still like the SpaceX motor where you just bring it in and you put it up like, like the V2 did. That was great. You bring it in, you put up, lock it, and go. That's the way it ought to be. Uh, you got the load and unload propellants, and you in liquids, or well, liquids, but most technical stuff, you're going to need to have a lot of test facilities. You're going to have to have system integration labs that you build up. Thank God they're real simple to build now because I've seen them that you can put them on avionics for a small rocket, you can put on that table easily with lots of space left. Come on. <laughs> the business challenges to orbit, first, how much money you got? You know, it's like. Two to four million. That's 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 a ballpark figure. Maybe you get it less than a little two million. I don't know how much. <coughs> you certainly do for more than, than four million. I guarantee it. Uh, you gotta buy. You gotta remember when you build a rocket like this, you're buying equipment and probably buying services too, like the computational fluid dynamics analysis. The FAA is going to ask you about. You're probably going to buy that. You're not going to get a CSD guy unless you're real lucky. Uh, you gotta budget everything. Human resources. The biggest problem is getting the people that have the knowledge. Can you get a guy that knows structures? Flight dynamics, um, propulsion, like instabilities, communications, all that sort of things, all that stuff. Control, and then you have to have, if you're going to do this on an amateur shot, it's going to be a lot of personal time. Figure a minimum of 10 hours a week for four years to five years. Maybe get a team of 50 people. <coughs> the organization, you've got to have good leadership. And if this team is spread out all over the country or over the world, like sure shot to space, those guys have people in Europe and in Asia is contributing stuff to them. They send them hardware. So you got to coordinate all that. That's, in, that's doable today. 20 years, 20 years ago, that would have been insane. You could have done it. But spreading out and communicating is real critical. Ah, the regulatory challenges. I have friends that, um, uh, I have friends in the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation. I went to the International Space University, and uh, some, of my, some of my, not my classmates, but people who went to the ISU are there in the o OCST. And we, I've had numerous drinks with them, and they tell me, if you're going to do this, you got to go early. When you get the idea, walk in and talk to them. They love to talk to you. They've got probably, they, these guys are probably like 15 case officers. They're each talking to like 20, 30 people. It's an amazing number of guys think they can do this stuff. FAA's going to require the most detailed safety review you could ever imagine. I guarantee it. It's going to be less like the military. <coughs> and the office, and they, they will issue a license. Launch ranges, there's another big cost center. You're just going to be, federal ranges are expensive. You just can't go out and fly this thing somewhere. If you're going to launch from orbit on the coast, it's going to be the coast. You're going to have to get it at a, at a certified range. The government won't let you launch unless it's at a real, honest to God range. Uh, flight termination software is probably the most important to them. Insurance. Actually, no, a guy used to write this insurance. Um, the FAA is going to require you have probably, I don't, know, I don't know what the limit says, it's millions <coughs> of dollars in insurance. So you're going to probably spend. 50,000 bucks on insurance for your launch. And finally, it's ITAR. All this rocket stuff that's going to orbit is going to be controlled under the International Traffic of Arms regulations. There's going to, you're, some of the stuff you deal with will be on the munitions list. So you have to con control it accordingly. Which may be a problem if the guys who are doing design work in England and, and, uh, and Australia and Singapore. You know, how do the ITAR, when they're sending me the information, it's complicated. Ah, now my group, and uh, I have another member of the group, Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, Whitman is back there. Um, Midwest Propulsion Group, our motto is thrust is a must. Thank you, Andrew. I'm still not Andrew. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Joseph, God, God, I'm sorry. It's, I'm sorry. We have another guy in the club named Andrew. <laughs> he is Joseph, Joseph Whitman, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me, I, I, I'm going to buy you a drink or something. <laughs> Okay, uh, our purpose is basically threefold. First, we're, we're, um, we're technical. Um, we basically want, want to um, get, teach people about things like turbines and rocket engines. 
Our group has a bunch of, I'll talk about turbines. We want to learn the systems uh, that are real systems. We're going to restore turbines. We were, we, the rocket engine we're going to show you is an, an old rocket engine dates from the 60s, so we're restoring a rocket engine too. Uh, we do recycle analysis performance. We want to have fun at the end. Um, number two, practical knowledge, reinforce your technical theoretical knowledge. If you join our organization, you will get your hands dirty. I guarantee it. You learn such interesting things as turbine and rocket operation and maintenance. Now, how many places can you go and learn that uh, from guys that do real turbines and rockets? You learn instrumentation, data acquisition, logging, electronic controls. You learn how to solder if you don't know how to solder, which is a useful thing. You learn a lot of metalworking, machining, welding, and compos composite layout. We also done outreach programs for us for schools. This last four, um, this is actually my fifth event this year. Last year we did Maker Fest here in Dayton. We went to the um, Tech Fest, which was in um, just we just had Tech Fest in Sinclair two weeks ago. Uh, the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force when they had Space Day, we were there, and we were at Scope Out in Cincinnati, which Scope Out is where the Cincinnati Observatory. If you're not from around here, Cincinnati has this private observatory that's connected with UC now, and uh, they have a, a big astronomy event there. So we a bunch of rocket guys came down there. They showed off the rocket. It was fun. By the way, see this kid right here? He was, um, his name is Jack, um, Jack E. Jack, uh, I think he's a sophomore freshman in that picture. He worked for the club for a while, now he's in <coughs> Pittsburgh, no, Pitts, Pittsburgh or Mount, Mount, County of Mount Pittsburgh, Rock Rock Street, I forget which one, he's in one of those schools. <coughs> As a freshman studying, um, he's studying robotics. And there's some people working on some different systems in the old days. Propulsion, that's what our group's about, propulsion. Uh, we have an LR-101. The, uh, we have done numerous solids. We've done solids as big as a 90, um, what, 98 inches. We've done, done dozens of solids at the one inch, or 38 millimeter grain size. Done lots of those. <coughs> the turbine guys, we've got probably four turbines. The turbine guys are down in Cincinnati. They're all GE employees, surprise, surprise. And they, um, you know, I don't know how to get rocket engines. If you're in the airplane business, you know how to get airplane parts. These guys get turbines. I mean, they actually, he, the guy, the guy named Bill Rossi, he's a, he was a turbine guy, group lead. He bought like four of those solars. These are old APUs, I think, off ships. He sold, um, sold three of them. And then we reverse engineered. That was an electrical mechanical system. Had, that had very good electronics. We reverse engineered to a digital system. So the club did pretty good on that. Here's our next project, the GE um, CT-15. That's a helicopter engine timed out, so you can't use it for anything else uh, in, in aviation. So we, he, he, I don't know how we got it. I think he, he just knew somebody that had it. He said, you, you know, you want to get rid of it. Sometimes these things are sitting around and people say, I don't want this thing. It's a piece of junk. I'm going to throw it out. I don't know. I'll take it. So he knows how to take it. If, you know, if you're in the business, you get to know that people. Ah, here's the Atlas Vernier. <coughs> this thing was first used on the Thor, the Atlas, and I've been told the Titan one, um, Titan one first block. If you go down to the museum, you can see this engine sitting on on the Thor, and the uh, it's on the Thor. It's on the bottom. I'm surprised the Atlas is on the side. That right there is the LR101 working. It's a, it was a Vernier. The reason those things are there was in the middle 50s. We you know, that's what a, what a 50,000 pound thrust engine, 350,000 pound thrust engine that lift off something like that. On Atlas, they couldn't control those very well. They didn't have the technology and the control ability to actuate a 50,000 pound thrust engine. It was it was kind of tricky. Now by by 58, 59, 60, they had it. Those things all went away. But before then, those verniers worked very well. Now the reason they got rid of them was the standard thing: you want fewer parts, you want you know less systems, more reliability sort of thing. But during their time, those things worked very well. Uh, Thrust about 1,000 pounds, uh, chamber thrust of 350 on about 550 PSI in the tanks. Tim Pickens, who, um, he designed Burt Rattan's uh, um, hybrid rocket for the NSRX Prize. I've known him for years. He works, he, uh, he's a, I won't say a rags or riches story, but he was a middle class guy. He was in dragsters. Then he found out about rocketry, got into rocketry real big. He built, um, for example, a hybrid rocket and put it on a bicycle. And he, his, his, he, the way he corrected his daughter said, if you don't, you know, mind do what I say, you don't get to ride the hybrid rock or rocket bicycle. And it was pretty effective. Bert Rattan saw that when he was in Huntsville. 
he asked Tim, he said, how are you doing that? What are you doing? He started to explain him, because, you know, it's all a bicycle. It's like 15, 20 pounds of thrust. So Rattan said, hey, can we build that on a rocket? So Tim Pickens worked, worked for Burt Rattan for about three, three and a half, four years uh, building, the, building the thing. Then Tim started a company called Di um, Orion Propulsion, where they would build rockets for food. They had a t-shirt. I have one of those t-shirts. And then Dianetics um, bought them out for, I think he made like $12 million in that sale. So he, he, he did like, a, who was it, um, the guy down at Morse Technology, sold for numerous millions of dollars, he did quite well. So now Tim is in the midst of like, starting another company. <laughs> so that's our, we're talking about our test stand. This test stand is sitting right in um, my, uh, my back building right now. That's the LR101 in half. It's um, <clears throat> circa 1960s, middle 60s, we've been told. Uh, we have uh, two tanks, liquid oxygen tanks, a big swim, kerosene tank, a small one. We have uh, pneumatic controls, all these are all red lines, our pneumatic controls, nothing electrical here. Um, the tanks are good for about, we tested them to uh, 750 PSI. The line was dead straight when you, when you did a static test, I was very happy. Uh, an eight inch wall tank, wall thickness is good to about 1,000 PSI before it yields. At room temperature, probably a little better than 1,000 PSI because it's cold. Uh, data acquisition, we currently have a National Instrument 6009 with LabVIEW, four load cells, four pressure transducers. We, if we load the tanks up full, we have a little haulage, we get about 18 seconds of burn time in it. <coughs> Here's what we're currently doing. Um, <coughs> the LOX kerosene, the LOX and kerosene system is already assembled, it's, it's ready to go. We tested it, it seems to work. System data acquisition has been integrated quite well, I've been happy with it. We had a little problem with the igniter system. We, um, we had everything working, but we can't get both. We have two, we have igniter, two pyros, two little igniters going off at the same time. We can't, for some reason, they don't go off together, and we're trying to work that out. Uh, the control system's integrated into the stand. We did a cryo test just about a year ago, and it worked quite well. We filled up five times with liquid nitrogen, blew it out. Every time filled up, blew it out, worked great. Did emergency shutdowns, emergency shutdowns worked great. Next thing, uh, coming up, we have a static foundry March 19th. We have to do, uh, we have a few other things to do. We have locks cleaning to do in about, um, about a week and a half we start cleaning. We disassemble and clean for locks. That's a, big, that's a very important thing. So we have a little process we do. And hopefully we'll static fire. Let me show you where we're static fire at. Okay. This is a very northern, it's called North Montgomery County Line Road. And guess what that is? That's the northern uh, line of Montgomery County, but we're right in that. Oh, no, we're not in Montgomery County. We're in the Green County thing. The county where I live in, he writes, uh, that's, I'm in Montgomery County. This is a place called Diamond Laurel Road. This farm actually is, is not lived in right now. The farmers, it's amazing. The guy that owns this land, he's a pyrotechnic. Um, he shoots fireworks for, for the guys who shoot fireworks, a guy named Rossi. And uh, Tim Stebbins said, yeah, this is neat. So we're going to shoot right about there, and we're going to decide which direction for you. And see this thing right here? It's about a 10-foot gully. So guess where we'll be at when we static fire? We'll be down in the alley. <laughs> That's where. We could actually build. The rocket's been assembled more than once. Okay, when they center in this white thing, there will be four fins that will be about 23 feet long. The nose cone, all that equipment exists right now somewhere in my house. And uh, this, by the way, is a standard rocket cardboard tube. It's about a foot in diameter. So this is uh, the tanks that are, I, I should, should have. The next one I'll show you here. That's what it looks like. That's the, um, just the tank end. Kerosene, uh, let's see, lock is the bottom, kerosene, and uh, let's look, the night and helium tank, and this is where the nose cone sits on that. There's the engine that's installed, the tank's <coughs> outside. This, this has been changed, but these have been slid down about a foot this way, 23 foot long. 
Uh, it's good about 30,000 feet liftoff, and we'll talk about the. Uh, there's the rocket on the test stand. We fired it. I will be talking about that. There's the gantry that sits right beside my house. Um, weighs about 290 pounds. If you go full full force, it's 290 pounds of liftoff. 210 pounds empty weight. It's 90 pounds of propellants. That's a fair amount of stuff. Burn time, 18 seconds. That's what it looked like when it was a wreck when we, we tried to static fire it. Now, I'll talk about the static fire. It happened a number of years ago in this system. This is at Anderson, Indiana, at Anderson Airport. If you go there, that's the runway of Anderson. And we were sitting right there and we fired it. We loaded up six seconds of locks and, heat, locks and kerosene, um, installed, uh, put the rocket up, attached all the instruments, loaded locks. And here's the videos. Now we'll show you some interesting videos. So, are you using turbines to provide the propellant to the motor, or are you just using a pressurized system with the union for pressurizing it to, to push the propellants? It's pressurized. Yes, we have to pressure it. We, we don't have, I, I couldn't afford them. Those <coughs> things are a bit beyond our ability right now. I, I shouldn't say, are you just doing it, because <laughs> I, even what you're doing <laughs> is incredible. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is the rocket. It's at Anderson Airport. That, by the way, is a control tower. There's a camera right there. This, this is the what we call the far camera. That right there is the near camera. I will show you the video from the near camera next. At about 53 seconds, where are we at right now? 28. Okay, you can hear the birds <coughs> singing in the background. This is, there's a hole, by the way. This is going into a hole about, oh, about five foot eight, <coughs> about three foot wide, eight foot long. That's the dirt from the hole, and we're back over a hill over here because we're not we're not crazy. <laughs> and we're it's all by the way run by the lines. See that that wasn't normal, is it? <laughs> okay. Now let's look at the inside. Let's go a lot quicker. This is what it's like being on this kind of explosion. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty exciting. Okay. Is that, is that the same type thruster you're working with now? Pardon me? The, the same type thruster you're working with now? Yes. Investigation, or yeah, I guess is that the right word? Igniter goes on at 44.65 or 44.6 seconds. The main valve is open about a tenth of, uh, two tenths of a second later. You can see the so you have plume, and then you have ignition failure basically about a second and a half after it goes. <coughs> ignition doesn't ignite. The pit begins to fill with gas and misted fuel. That's not a good. That's not good. Okay, 48 seconds. So it takes about what is that? Uh, it's about from 48 to 49. So, so it's, it's, it, the explosion starts here, and the explosion goes pretty quick to the last frame before the side blast. So you go about half a second. Then side blast starts. Side blast, that's, that's a long side blast. That's like 15 feet long. It's big. And there it's, it's stamped down. <coughs> this is a close-in camera. This is where you get the real evidence. This, I know you guys can't see this, it's a lot easier to see. This, there's an orange line. That's our igniter line. That's where it's sitting in close. Here we have the ignition, that, that, that smoke is the pyrotechnic igniter going. There's the igniter line. Everything looks good. Here we have ignition. That's real ignition right there. That line is still in position. However, the igniter suddenly, you see this line right here? It's pushed out. It's kicked out because the containment system, the way you held the engine, or the 
igniter on the engine wasn't strong enough. They got pushed out. And you see it stretched out. In fact, if you see it down here, you actually see it burning. If you get real close, you see sort of where it's burning. Tool spots burning. And then it falls to the ground. And the pit fills. It starts to, the exhaust starts to kick things up. And lo and behold, boom, you have an explosion. And then here the side start, the side blast starts. That's how long the side blast. That's a pretty long thing. That's probably 15, 20 foot long. That's two thirds of the rocket. Well, probably two thirds of the rocket. The rocket's 23 foot tall. And there were its clears. Here is the proof right there. See that split? You can't see that split. Basically, that between the lock stone and the engine, there was a major split. And the exhaust, that's where we think the exhaust came from. Up close, that big flame came through that, probably about an eighth of an inch thick split, and it, and it shot it out. It damaged that, it damaged this thing, cut the stop, aluminum um, box so, so bad we couldn't use it anymore. We had to make a new one. Is it gasket around there? Or yes, it is. What kind of gasket? That one. And here's the other confirming pit. That's igniter, it's sitting in the, the pit. And when you look at it, <coughs> It's not very burnt, is it? That's the problem. See these clips? The clips weren't strong enough. The current requirement is I can't pull the thing out with my hand. We change requirements. The investigation summary. The igniter was pushed out during test start, fell to the ground, uh, misted kerosene, gas, and oxygen mixed. We had an explosion. And the um, front went inside the engine. So all that mixture, the flame front went right back in the engine hit the top, it shot out the side. So, we, um, lesson learned. Um, the igniter attachment was not robust. That's basically what we learned the hard way. Uh, high pressure system leaked a little bit during loading. Uh, the on-site, we had a bunch of on-site issues about getting it up on the gantry, loading it upright. We, we had to do it again. We had to make everything loaded when the rocket's upright, just like the Germans did. If we just looked at the Germans, we'd have been a lot better off. Uh, you better read it. We got we had we liked our we got better resolution on our data acquisition. We got better signal conditioning. Um, one thing we learned is you do everything in the shop before you take it out to the stand. If it ain't, if you can't do it in the shop, you can't probably can't do it in the field. And we learned that the hard way. That's why we don't. That's why everything that thing when we roll it out, we know everything works. It's been tested and it pop works right. We consider wireless instrumentation. We decide not to go that way. We have um, a fairly expensive thing. We had a software control over wireless. We didn't like it. Now we have a manual control box, 200 foot wire. We sit and control everything much better. And we've improved our instrumentation. Um, that's all I have. Um, usually this is for a, a much younger crowd. Um, so you guys all know that's where every place humans have been forever. And that's usually the uh, future for us is up. And it's all this a rocket crowd. So I appreciate you guys coming. Any questions? <laughs> I was going to get a hold of you if you want to join your group. Um, you can, um, uh, Wills, W-I-L-L-S, R-W, at gmail.com. We're on Facebook at Midwest Propulsion Group. Uh, Facebook slash Midwest Propulsion Group. And that's our, our thing. You can see where we're going. Joe! Oh, I was going to ask if you remembered my name. But <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Of, that's this is a, my 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 block instruction. We don't spend too much money while I'm here. Just you know, like women are buying uh, kits or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys, local guys, want to come out? Uh, yeah, come on out. We'll be glad, glad to show you what we're doing. And put you to work. Any ham radios here that want to come out? We can, we can sure use you. Ham, good man. I could use you. Nineteen. Ham radio BSWT. I'm, I'm, I'm rusty, but I'm fair with a lathe and a bridge board. <laughs> My type of person. We, we've got, I, I have a bridge board. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have to decide when I'm fed up with my employer and have to tell them to <laughs> stuff it. Which would maybe in July. <laughs> well, I retire in 18, 16 months, so.
Not you, not you, you understand the mindset. <laughs> no, <you're there. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's up next? Retire that he can go off and <coughs> yeah. do the stuff full time. Ah. Yeah, yeah. So, 